And what uh, what interested you in this uh, session on Hebrew, getting it right? Um, just, I, I love the Hebrew language, so I thought it would be cool. I'm not exactly sure what um, Hebrew at the center is, but I guess I'll find out. I guess you will. All right, why don't we, uh, why don't we get going? Um, first of all, welcome. I'm uh, Rabbi Andrew Urgis. I'm the CEO at Hebrew at the Center. I'm also a, a former uh, head of a day school. I spent uh, 15 years in informal education as a camp director and working in Israel as an Israel educator. And I'm also a graduate student in Jewish education, finishing up my doctorate in Hebrew pedagogy and identity. So that's a little bit about me. Uh, welcome, Danny. Um, a little bit about Hebrew at the Center. Uh, Hebrew at the Center um, is dedicated to revolutionizing the teaching and learning of Hebrew in all educational settings worldwide. And we really strive to make Hebrew a normative part of American Jewish life, which is a wonderful uh, goal, uh, but we know that there are a tremendous amount of challenges. And we'll learn a little bit about that today. Um, the goal uh, for this, uh, this uh, evening's uh, brief presentation <coughs> One, thinking a little bit about articulating you and your schools, Lama Ivrit, your Y Hebrew, um, have an opportunity to learn a little bit about Hebrew in America, have an opportunity to figure out how do you get, the, what are the key steps to getting Hebrew right, having the opportunity to learn a little bit about the resources that Hebrew at the center brings to the field, and of course, a little bit of opportunity at the end for any Q and A. Um, but let's start with that first that first thing that Lama Ivrit. You know, what's our what's our reason uh, for Hebrew? Well, for some people, Hebrew is the language of our history that connects us to our past. For others, Hebrew is the language of our heritage and you know, of our religious practice. Hebrew is the language of our text, not only ancient, but also contemporary. Hebrew is a primary language in the Jewish state, and it's a way to connect not only with Israel, but with Israelis. Some people want to learn Hebrew because they're interested in learning another language, and Hebrew is one of them. For some people, Hebrew learning is about how it develops our brain and helps us develop uh, a sense of empathy and of perspective. And of course, Hebrew is something that we say is the language of the Jewish people. So for some people, it's a tzfat em, it's a mother tongue. For others, it's a tzfat um. Those are some of the reasons for why we might study Hebrew. Um, but how are we doing? Uh, in 2013, the, the Pew Report came out trying to describe what is going on in the American Jewish community. It looked at lots of different things, attitudes, behaviors, practices, but it also had a few different questions about Hebrew. So first of all, it turns out 52% of American Jews said that they know the Hebrew alphabet. That's something. Um, but when we ask them, do you understand what you're reading? Only 13% say yes. 35% say, um, I understand some of the words, and of course, a very small percent can read it, but have no idea whatsoever of what they're, what they're reading. And of course, that means 48% can't even decode the 22 letters. So we're not doing really well on the Hebrew reading and even worse on the Hebrew writing. What about Hebrew speaking? Only 12% of American Jews said they could have a conversation in Hebrew. 5% they can ha have some sort of conversation and 83% said they couldn't have any conversation. Um, interestingly enough, when we look at that 12%, um, there may be as many as a million Israelis and children of Israelis living in America. So they may account for the large amount of that 12%. So as a whole, we're not doing great. Even when we look at those people within that 12% group, who say they can have a conversation, we can see that 32% of them went for up to five years 
to yeshiva or day school. 15% went for six to 10 years. 18% went through all uh, 13 years of school and beyond. Another 64% had some sort of formal Jewish education. It's not clear what that means. Um, it may be that in addition to what they did in a day school or yeshiva, they also went to a part-time a religi religious school, might've had a tutor, might've gone to a Hebrew rich camp. Um, and then a very small percent, 6% say they can have a conversation in Hebrew, but have no formal Jewish education. We're almost certain that those are children of individuals who are Hebrew speakers uh, or speaking some Hebrew at home. So as a whole, we're not doing great. But what Hebrew at the Center is really committed to is revolutionizing this and changing and transforming the position of Hebrew in America. So how do we go about this? How does a school or an individual who cares about Hebrew <clears throat> get it right? Well, first of all, we start out with saying, let's answer our Lama Ivrit. What's our goal? Is our school interested mostly in ensuring that Hebrew, that somebody can function in Hebrew around classic Jewish texts? Is it that we want them not only to have facility with the, with the Sidur, but understand what they're saying? Are we preparing them for life in Israel where it's the uh, contemporary modern language that may be more important? Or do we want them to be contributors or consumers of, of Hebrew culture? So figuring out your Lama Ivri is pretty important. Um, this is a table that comes from a study that was done in 2017 of Hebrew in the day school space uh, called Hebrew for What? The Heart of the Matter by Alex Thompson and Jack Wertheimer, and they organized the different Lama Ivrites um, in, these, in these interesting ways. First of all, they said, we need to differentiate between modern Hebrew and classical. And then when we think about modern Hebrew, it's about the modern Hebrew of the Jewish people. Remember, modern Hebrew started outside of the land of Israel um, with the early uh, Hebrew poets and, and authors. Or is modern Hebrew mostly about our Israel engagement agenda? And then when it comes to classical Hebrew, is it about Sidur, about Tefillah, about the spiritual dimensions of the language? Or is it about tech skills? We need to clarify what's our Lama Ivri. And then we can also cut it along the horizontal. In what ways does Hebrew play a symbolic role where there's a sense of appreciation the same sort of feeling that um, somebody arrives in an international airport and they suddenly see welcome signs in 20 languages and one of those languages is in Hebrew. You don't have to know what the words mean to feel appreciated, appreciative of the symbolic nature. And then obviously there's the symbolic component of, of, of part, being a participant in what would be called a ethno-linguistic community, a community that can, can say things like, Shabbat Shalom, and people know what they're saying. Or Dafka, this happened to me, and people know what they're saying. Those are symbolic reasons. And then, of course, there's practical reasons. How do we become both consumers and producers? What they also found in their study, however, is that most schools had not gone through this process of understanding their Lama Ivrit. This was descriptive of what they found, but it was all over the place. In, in fact, more often than not, in the same school, different teachers had different reasons for their Lama Ivrit. So we find that the first thing that we do to help a school get it right with Hebrew is understand what are your goals? What sort of outcomes will ensure that you are succeeding? The second thing that we often do is we remind people that Hebrew learning, especially when we talk about modern Hebrew, is not actually learning one skill. You don't, you don't learn Hebrew. You're learning four different skills when you do language learning. You're learning how to read, you're learning how to write, you're learning how to speak, you're learning how to comprehend. Two of these are expressive, two of these are receptive. And we all learn them in different ways and at different speeds. We also tend to learn language along a predictable trajectory that at the very bottom, what's called the novice uh, level, uh, we might know our, a few body parts, a few colors. We might know how to say our name. 
um, we can describe some nouns, a handful of verbs, the things that are around us. As we begin to increase our learning of a language, um, it slows down because we have to spread out our knowledge. We begin to move from just the present tense to the past tense, to the future. We begin to talk about more nouns, about things that we can't say, things that are less concrete. As we continue moving up this cone into the advanced level, it becomes even more complicated. As we talked about abstractions, as we begin to understand the relationship between a language and a culture. And then obviously one can continue to learn. You can become superior or even distinctive. And you should know most native speakers don't even reach distinctive, meaning they don't have the language skills, for example, to write a professional journal article in their own language. This cone of proficiency is an essential component of how we help schools become effective at getting it right. And I use the word proficiency, it means how does someone become proficient in the language? And that's very different than when we think about how does somebody um, be performative in a language. If you give someone a worksheet and you teach them what all the things are and then they repeat it back to you, they're performing the language. But if you drop them off in the middle of Israel, unless your worksheet was exactly about all of the things around them, the fact that they can perform doesn't mean that they're proficient. And when it comes to modern Hebrew, we feel you can get it right when you can bring this proficiency approach uh, to your work. So this is kind of a, 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 a gisha, an approach that we think is pretty essential. The other thing that um, we think is incredibly important, once you've figured out your Lama Ivrit and understood how language learning occurs, then we say it's really essential to think about how are you gonna assess your, your, your progress. Uh, we work very closely with a partner at Avant. It's a private nonprofit partnership. We've created the only tool that can measure um, an individual's learning from novice uh, low to advanced high in all four Hebrew skills. And this is, a, for example, a chart from a particular uh, grade level comparison um, at a school. You can see that we can measure uh, how the students are doing in reading, in writing, in listening, and speaking. And when we work with the school, we often say, let's start by doing a uh, uh, you know, a baseline assessment. And then let's use tools like this to understand how each individual student is doing, how each classroom is doing, what's going on with particular teachers, how is the school doing as a whole, and how can we compare this to national averages. And then we can use analysis of these data to help develop a professional learning plan uh, for the teachers. I say professional learning because another thing that this study uh, Hebrew, uh, Hebrew for what, Hebrew at the matter learned is that in the day school space, uh, only about 50% of, of Hebrew teachers even have a BA in education. A much smaller group uh, has a master's and hardly any have a master's in second language acquisition with a focus in Hebrew. So we know that most of the faculty have just elemental idea uh, knowledge about education. And for many, what made them uh, appropriate for being a Hebrew instructor is that they were Hebrew speakers. But that's almost like saying, well, I have teeth. I guess I could be a dentist. So um, although we can give advice on various curricula, um, our approach really is about teachers. And as a former head of school, I can tell you, great education rises and falls on the quality and the training of teachers. And because so few people have received a graduate training in second language ac acquisition in Hebrew, we find that professional learning in particular, uh, pedagogy uh, makes all of the difference to getting it right. So we help develop professional development work plans. We offer online courses in a range of subjects. We do lots and lots of workshops, either for schools or for the field as a whole, for both Hebrew and Hebrew leaders. We do a lot of coaching and mentoring with experienced pedagogues who they themselves have been Hebrew teachers and leaders. 
we have an intensive certificate program. And then of course, now one can get a graduate degree, sort of the heart of where that work is going on right now is at Middlebury College. We also work with the school through embedded services. We help them develop through a year or a multi-year initiative, an entire approach to get Hebrew right. We give them lots and lots of learning tools that we've developed, whether it's around differentiated education, uh, teaching Hebrew to students with learning differences, uh, unit development, et cetera. We also talk a lot about attitudes and behaviors. If our graduates can speak Hebrew, but they don't like it, we think we have failed. So attitudes and behaviors of teachers, of, of students, of teachers, of non-Hebrew teachers, of parents, these are all incredibly important. We also work with them to enable cultural change. If we're going to move the needle in terms of the position of Hebrew in America, we're gonna also have to think about how do we make Hebrew more important even within the Jewish day school space. We offer a membership to schools that allow all of their teachers uh, to have access to a number of online tools, uh, special coaching, special workshops, et cetera. And we have two model schools uh, one in DC and one in Chicago that are sort of helping function as a source for R&D on how to do this even better. The third thing that we do at Hebrew at the Center is we help people make the case for Hebrew. Most Hebrew teachers care passionately about the language, but not everyone in the school community may be on the same page. So we offer programming for adults around Hebrew advocacy called Sicha, and we bring new research around Hebrew language instruction to the field through a series called Skira. We actually go in and we work with professionals and lay leaders in the school to help them think about how they make the case for Hebrew as a differentiator for their school to convince parents to both join schools and remain in schools. We help with grants and grant writing. We spend a lot of time talking to the community to make certain that there are financial resources to support this um, and of course, we come out to the field like this to meet with people we, uh, like you. So that's a little bit about who we are and what we do. I'd be happy to use the next few minutes to answer any questions that people have. You can see here my personal email address and our website. Can I uh, uh, take any questions from anyone? What I will do is I'm putting in the uh, chat a link to that study. Right now, it's probably the best, <clears throat> the best information we have about Hebrew in the day school space. Um, it was uh, produced by Avichai, one of the last things they did before they sunset on the foundation, but you can still download uh, the study at this, uh, at this link. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sure, any questions I can answer for you? I have to digest all of that and think. <laughs> yeah. They say 20 so minutes to <laughs> make it rich. <laughs> really appreciate this. My pleasure. And of course, if you have uh, any questions, don't, uh, don't hesitate to email. Thank you. We have you. a wonderful team that's happy to help. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great Good night. Pilot off.